Hi everybody. Today I'm going to talk about degenerate Fermi gases and we're going to find the Fermi energy. So we defined in a previous lecture the Fermi Dirac distribution function and that's the average occupation of a single energy state um, within uh, a system of fermions. So this is n bar which is equal to 1 over e to the epsilon minus mu over kt plus 1. Now to remind you, here epsilon is the energy of the state, mu is the chemical potential, k is Boltzmann's constant, and t is the temperature. So in this lecture, we're going to go ahead and define the Fermi energy. And that's going to be um, the chemical potential as the system approaches absolute zero. So we're going to say that the chemical potential as the system approaches absolute zero is now called the Fermi energy, which makes our distribution function as shown here, 1 over e to the epsilon minus the Fermi energy over kt plus 1. So in this Fermi energy, if the energy is um, equal to the Fermi energy, then that means that you have here in the bottom of your distribution function e to the 0, which is, of course, 1. So then that means that your um, average occupation is 1 half. Okay? Now, if t is approaching 0, and the energy is greater than the Fermi energy, then that means that your Fermi Dirac distribution function is approaching 1 over e to the infinity plus 1, which is 1 over infinity, which is 0. So that basically means that the occupation of your energy state is going to be 0 as the temperature approaches absolute 0 if the energy of that straight state is greater than the Fermi energy. Now, if the energy is less than the Fermi energy, then as t approaches absolute zero, then you have a uh, e to the negative, right? At epsilon minus e Fermi is negative here, and then you're dividing by zero. So that means that it's approaching one over e to the minus infinity plus one, and e to the minus infinity approaches zero. So you have one over zero plus one or one. So basically that says that if the energy is less than the Fermi energy, then as temperature approaches zero, that state will be occupied. And, of course, if the energy is greater than the Fermi energy, as temperature approaches zero, that state will not be occupied. Okay? So at t is equal to zero, at absolute zero, fermions would be occupying the lowest energy states available to them. And near this temperature, there's very little chance that thermal agitation is going to kick a fermion to an energy greater than the Fermi energy. And the probability that a fermion will have an energy greater than the Fermi energy is zero at low temperatures. So you can consider the Fermi energy to be the highest energy state available to fermions at low temperatures. And if you look at what the distribution function looks like, at t is equal to zero, your distribution function would look like a step function. Below the Fermi energy, it would be occupied. Above the Fermi energy, it would not be occupied. And then as um, t goes greater than absolute zero, what happens is this step function gets rounded off, okay? And you do have some states that are slightly above the Fermi energy that could be occupied. As the temperature increases, that step function gets more and more smeared out. Now, at the Fermi temperature, let's define the Fermi temperature as k, T Fermi equals the Fermi energy, so that the T Fermi is equal to the E Fermi over Boltzmann's constant. At that temperature, you have a very rounded off step function. It barely looks like a step function anymore. And for temperatures greater than the Fermi energy, you basically just have exponential decay, a simple decaying exponential. But the truth is that, for example, for most metals, the Fermi energies are a few electron volts. So if you were to solve for what the Fermi temperatures would be for a few electron volts, that's like 10,000 Kelvin or greater. And of course, most materials melt long before then. <laughs> so for all practical purposes, uh, you can consider your Fermi energy for reasonable temperatures to be the highest occupied energy state because your step function isn't getting rounded off very much. Okay? So that's what the Fermi energy is. It's the highest occupied energy state for most reasonable temperatures, okay? So how do we find this Fermi energy and what expression can we use? Because we can see that it might be something useful to know. So let's start off 
thinking about uh, degenerate Fermi gases um, in terms of one specific example of that. And that's the electron in a metal, okay? Remember that the model of conduction says that you have, for example, in a silver lattice, all right, you have a bunch of ions, silver ions, because each one of those silver atoms has donated a free electron to the sea of electrons, okay? So we're going to model those conduction electrons that are freely moving around our silver lattice as a um, free electron gas. These electrons are no longer bound to their parent atoms and are just moving around the lattice wherever they want to go. Now, just like we did for the Boltzmann distribution for an ideal gas in a previous lecture, we're going to consider those electrons to be quantum particles that are trapped in a three-dimensional infinite square well potential. Okay? So, that means that using this 3D infinite square well potential energy, we have H squared over 8ML squared times nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared. Now here h is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules second. m here would be the mass of our fermion. In this case, the fermion would be the free electron roaming around, so that would be the mass of the electron. l, let's assume that our, um, our metal, our metal is like a cube with length side l on the all sides, okay? So we're going to do that, and that would be um, L squared there on the bottom, the length of our cube that we're confining it to. Now, NX, NY, and NZ are the quantum numbers for confinement here, okay? So these are the quantum numbers from the infinite square row potential covered in a previous lecture. Now, these free electrons, we're considering them to be just roaming around, okay? And so remember that in the infinite square model, there's no potential inside. We're just modeling it this way. So there's no potential inside. And so all the energies that the electrons have are kinetic energies. So we could easily set that equal to their kinetic energy, p squared over 2m. We're definitely modeling these electrons as non-relativistic. And I'll kind of prove that to you, that they are non-relativistic in just a second. Now, our quantum numbers are positive integers only. So they start up at 1 and go to infinity from there. So they can't be negative. Now, these are fermions, and they obey the exclusion principle. So um, what we're going to have is for each set of quantum numbers, we're also going to have two electrons occupying that set of nx, ny, and nz. Okay? Now, what's going to happen is the fermions obeying the exclusion principle are going to start to fill in these available energy states. Okay? No two of them can have the exact same set of quantum numbers, so you'll have nx, ny, nz, those could all be the same, but then only two electrons, one spin up and one spin down, will sit in each one. All right? Now, let's consider the system to be at absolute zero, and so the maximum possible quantum number filling in up to the max okay, um, would then give us our Fermi energy. And so let's say then that we have E Fermi is H squared times N max squared over 8 ML squared. And here I'm going to define N max squared as the sum of the squares of the quantum numbers for the X, Y, and Z dimensions respectively. Now, if we put that in quantum number space, okay, then N max would be the radius of this little 1 8 sphere here, okay? So then we have NX, NY, and NZ, and N max is the radius of our little 1 8 sphere. Now, this value of n max is going to depend on the total number of conduction electrons because, of course, you've got two fermions for each distinct set of nx, ny, and nz. So however many electrons you have, you're going to fill up, up to that available bit so you can see why there would be that dependence of n max on the number of conduction electrons. Now, we're assuming that these energy states in a, in a typical metal, in other words, are so close together as to seem continuous. We're not really modeling tiny little quantum particles here. We're modeling a bulk solid, okay? So these energy spacings are going to be very close together compared to, you know, the energies of the bulk. So we can find the number of states by following by finding the volume of this 1 8 sphere. It's a 1 8 sphere because we can only have positive values, and so that keeps us in this quadrant, which is then, of course, 1 8 of a total sphere. And then we're going to multiply by 2 um, of this volume that we've got here, and uh, that's to count for the spin up and spin down particles. So n here is going to be 2 times the volume of this sphere, and that's going to be 2 times 1 8 times 4 thirds pi n max 
cubed. And that's because, of course, the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, where r is the radius. The radius here is n max, okay? And we're only looking at 1 eighth of it. And for each set of nx, n, y, and z, we've got two electrons, so that's why the factor of two, okay? Now we're going to use this and um, find our Fermi energy expression. So, simplifying that expression, we have the total number of conduction electrons, big N, is equal to pi n max cubed over 3. That means that we can solve for n max, and n max would be 3n over pi to the 1 third power. All right, now let's plug this into the expression that we had earlier for our Fermi energy. The Fermi energy is h squared n max squared over 8ml squared. So, plugging in for n max, that gives us h squared times 3n over pi to the 2 thirds power divided by 8ml squared. Now we can take that L squared and we can move it inside of our 3n over pi to the 2 thirds, right? Because um, if you see here, I've moved it inside and now I have h squared over 8m times 3n over pi L cubed to the 2 thirds power. So if I take 1 over L cubed to the 2 thirds power, I get 1 over L squared, okay? So that's how I managed to do that. Now L cubed is equal to the volume of our little cube. Okay, it's the volume of our cube. So that means letting L cubed equal V, our Fermi energy expression is shown here. H squared over 8n times 3n over pi V to the 2 thirds power. Okay, so that's our expression for our Fermi energy. Okay, I'm going to stop there in this lecture. In uh, the coming lectures, I'm going to talk about the implications of this and our Fermi velocity, our Fermi temperature, and we're going to go on and derive the um, total internal energy for a system of fermions. See you then.